Welcome to the Hangar Z podcast, brought to you by Vertical Helicasts. In this two-part series, we sit down and talk with Desiree Horton. With over 33 years of aviation experience and over 10,000 flight hours under her belt, Desiree brings a wealth of experience to the world of public safety aviation. Currently serving as a fire rescue pilot for Kern County Fire Department, she's dedicated her career to protecting lives and property from the skies. Desiree Horton embarked on her aviation journey in 1990 in Southern California, navigating some of the busiest airspace and operating out of the Van Nuys Airport, one of the busiest airports. Her diverse background includes flying tours, charter flights, news coverage, traffic watch, and movie production work. For almost half her career, she honed her skills in various aviation roles before realizing her dream of becoming a fire pilot. The path to becoming a fire pilot was challenging in the early days with limited opportunities for those without prior experience. Undeterred, Desiree financed her own training for long line and mountain courses, securing a position with a company willing to give her a chance. She made history by becoming the first female pilot on an exclusive use contract for Region 5 with the U.S. Forest Service. After years of serving as a contract pilot for the U.S. Forest Service, Desiree achieved her goal of working for a fire department in Southern California. In 2013, she joined Cal Fire as a full-time female fire helicopter pilot, dedicated almost seven years to the organization. Continuing her trailblazing career, she moved on to the Orange County Fire Department in her hometown, where she became the first woman to work in air operations and as a pilot for the department. Currently, Desiree is breaking new ground with the Kern County Fire Department as the first ever female fire and rescue pilot. Driven by a desire to encourage women to explore opportunities in public safety aviation, she aspires to overcome obstacles and promote a positive culture within the industry. Thank you to our sponsors, Robinson Helicopters, Shot Over, Metro Aviation. Welcome to the Hangar Z Podcast, brought to you by Vertical Helicasts. The Hangar Z Podcast is the first and only podcast dedicated to promoting and exploring the personnel and equipment behind the missions in public safety aviation. Join your host, John Gray, Jeff Ratkovich, and Jack Shanley. Still southbound, skidding to a stop. Stand by here. Looks like you're getting ready to bail. Heads up, guys, bailing. Okay, the guy, he's running through the house, jumping the fence, through the shotgun, through something out. Grabbing the shotgun. Don't go over that fence. Don't go over that fence. Grab the shotgun again. He is armed. Stay there. Hold your position. Four on the stop. Good advising, Coach. Four on the stop. Hey, welcome to Hangar Z Podcast. I'm your host, John Gray. Have a really awesome conversation in store today. Someone that I've heard on the radio flying from point A to point B, which we talked about offline just a second ago, but she has no clue who, who most of us are. You know, being a female in aviation, you kind of get the the light shined upon you quite a bit. And she's done that for 30, you say 33 years now? Mm-hmm. 33 years, yeah. Wow. Been, been in aviation for 33 years. Uh, she's currently flying for Kern County Fire Department and uh, excited to talk about some of the challenges of flying up there. I know the weather can be super wild up there. And then just the conversation surrounding fire is going to be really fun. Uh, I haven't had an opportunity to talk to too many fire pilots. Tony Weber from San Diego County Fire. Uh, he's one of our co-hosts and, and good friends. He obviously is, is doing that work down in San Diego. But beyond him, we really haven't had a chance to dig into some of the challenges that, that surround your job and in that industry. So it'd be really fun to do that. But Desiree, welcome to the podcast and thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah. And then to, uh, to, to bring in the, the conversation all the way from London is Richard Brandon. How are you doing, sir? I'm very good. Thanks, John. Yeah, it's been uh, well over a year since we had you on the podcast. So it's a, it's an honor to have you back. How are things going over there? Things are going really well. And thank you so much for the opportunity. You know, I am really, really uh, honored to be back and uh, having a go as a co-host. And Desiree, lovely to meet you. Um, and good to yeah, meet you. I can't wait to have a really interesting conversation about the world that you uh, are flying within, which I have to say, I don't know an awful lot about. So it'd be fantastically entertaining and in- informative for me. For uh, the Hangar Z podcast, we, t- we typically have a script to go through. And the first part is usually the most important part. It's the hot seat question. I'm sorry, it's drink of the day. But being that, you know, fairly early in the day, Richard's later for you. What time is it in, in the UK right now? It's 20 past nine in the evening. So okay. I, I, it is, you know, okay for me to have a, a, a glass of wine, which I, I have. Because I, I was just eat, eating my uh, evening meal before we came on, so I didn't get to finish that. So I might finish that tonight. But yeah, here it's one one thirty basically in the afternoon. We got the kids to pick up, got all the afternoon uh, academics to do, and all that stuff. So keeping it light, going with a black rifle coffee in my Hangar Z Yeti. Um, so later, I'm sure it'll turn into 
something else in there. It's a little vodka soda or something, but for now, that's what I got. Desiree, what's your, what's your drink of the day? Well, because I knew that we had to have a drink of the day and I figured it's not morning time. I've got uh, gin and, and not tonic, but uh, sparkling water. So, All right. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, a little, little Hendrix and tonic. Yeah, the, the, the sparkling water, and I think I've, I've said this quite a few times. It's funny. I used to hate it. Uh, I've gotten to like sparkling water, you know, but now it, now I, it's part of, instead of vodka soda, it's vodka with sparkling water. So I'm right there with you. It does taste like TV, TV static a little bit though. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm happy to see you guys are, are both partaking. Now I feel like I'm the weak link. I got to go change my cup out for something a little more spicy. <laughs> you got responsibilities. <laughs> Well, cheers. Uh, yeah, cheers. Happy to have you guys yeah, on and, and happy to, to sit here and talk about aviation and, and what we're drinking. Uh, the next part of the, the podcast is the hot seat questions. So this is uh, just an opportunity for us to break the ice with some random questions that I, that I dig up and kind of see where the conversation takes us from here. The first one is, uh, it's wild. You know, I feel like our generation, you grew up and cartoons were a big part of our, our youth. Now I feel like kids don't necessarily watch cartoons a whole lot. They're on, they're on their iPads. They're playing video games. But for us, you know, animated cartoons were huge. So if, if you could be best friends with a character from any animated show, what show would you choose? And Desiree, we'll start with you. I don't know. Probably Tom and Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> was that your go-to cartoon when you were a kid? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, wa- I, I watched a little bit of everything, but that was like my favorite. I was just thinking while uh, while Desiree was talking, I, I I would probably be Shaggy or one of the Scooby Doo gang. I think <laughs> I, I, I I have vivid memories of uh, being a, a small kid watching Scooby Doo, and it was really funny because when my kids were growing up and they were watching Scooby Doo, which is clearly still going, um, we were you could go back to the original kind of nineteen seventies cartoons you know the original ones and see how much it had changed to the way they they do it and um and they're still good so yeah i would say one of the characters from the, the scooby-doo gang it's funny i feel like in hindsight you know as a kid as a kid you view things much differently than you do as an adult and as an adult to look back on the scooby-doo cartoons at least from when we were kids and i feel like the whole scooby-doo gang are a bunch of tweakers that drive around in a van and do all kinds of weird stuff baked on drugs <laughs> <laughs> the stuff you see you know it's really wild <laughs> Um, but yeah, Scooby-Doo is, is, is a great cartoon as a kid. I haven't seen the most recent ones, but, but yeah, that was definitely one of the ones of the era. Go, go gadget. Uh, miss, was it Mr. Inspector or what was, Inspector what was the name gadget, of that? Wasn't it? Inspector gadget. Yeah. That was, that was a great show when I was a kid. But when I think about cartoons, the Simpsons kind of been my staple cartoon as, you know, as a kid, as an adult, my kids are watching it now. So it's, it's fun to sit down and watch the Simpsons with them. So I feel like Homer is is the guy that I'd want to just have a beer with. You know, I don't know if I want to be best friends with Homer Simpson, but he seems like it'd be really fun to have a beer with. So I think I'd want to be best friends with, or at least friends with Homer Simpson, and go have a beer at Moe's Tavern. That's kind of the thing that 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 rings with me. This next question kind of goes in line with uh, the cartoon deal for a, a weird reason, but the question is: Would you rather be twelve inches tall or twelve feet tall? And Desiree, we'll start with you. Or feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you rather be 12 feet tall? All right, I see how things that are small get treated. <laughs> I don't know. I don't want to get stepped on. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess like an ant, you got to always be on, on your feet moving around. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Richard? Yeah, I, I'm the same. I would rather be 12, even though I can't imagine being 12 feet tall because it's more than double the height that I am. And uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'd rather look down on everything than up at everything. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah, I imagine, you know, you can't fly a helicopter whether you're 12 feet tall or 12 inches tall, so that doesn't really matter. It uh, doesn't really give you a lot of options, although there's some... I've I thought through like what could you do, what jobs could you do if you're 12 feet tall. There's a lot of manual labor jobs you could do that would be really easy. I think there's more you could do as a tall person than a yeah. much tall person. Although <laughs> yeah, you, you could get into some some really sneaky places as a 12 inch person. You know, that's you could, true. You could be uh, an espionage, you know, 
I don't know. <laughs> There's just all kinds of weird options. But um, yeah, that's for me, it seemed like it came in line with the cartoon stuff, I guess, with either one of those, if you're 12 feet tall or 12 inches tall. And then uh, the last one, again, our, our generation of music, the 80s and 90s were huge. And I feel like my kids, and not that they're the average kids, but I, I feel like they don't listen to music a ton. And if they do, uh, it's what, what we listen to or what I listened to when I was a kid in the 80s and 90s. So to that, Desiree, what's your go-to song that you sing in the car? Oh, gosh. Um, I'm actually kind of a, a weird person when it comes to that. I, I don't really listen to music or sing in the car. Yeah. I just drive in. Yeah, I, I use it as my time to just drive in silence. Um, but, you know, touching on the the 80s, I mean, I was I was into just about everything like Depeche Mode and U2 and, um, you know, all those bands, Guns N' Roses. So, yeah. Yeah, the, the U2, U2 Joshua Tree album, that was probably the best album of, of the oh, 80s. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. it was a great one. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, R- Richard, how about you? Well, it's funny you should mention Depeche Mode because I had a birthday this week. Oh, when, what is it? Last week I had a birthday. I won't tell you how old I was, but uh, it's got fives in it and two of them. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, my, my kids bought me tickets to go and see Depeche Mode in January. So uh, they're playing at the O2 Arena in London. And um, I might have dropped quite quite a few hints. But <laughs> but I, I now have I now have a ticket to go and see them uh, live. And I've seen them a few times over the years. But I, I, I'm, you know, I would say anything by them um, from certainly from the, uh, the early stuff from the 80s, right the way up to kind of the mid 90s. I really like their their material. So um, if I'm going to sing, it would have to be when I'm by myself in the car because, uh, you know, I don't sing well. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> but yeah. but if I'm the only audience, then nobody cares. It's right. Yeah, that's that's why I sing in the car. That's the only place that, you know, everyone thinks I'm great. <laughs> but yeah, the the Chicken Fried is my probably my favorite song by Zach Brown Band to 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 belt out. That's a that's a great song. But there's never a witness to it because again, it's in the car and I'm by myself. So <laughs> that's a, probably to everyone's benefit. I would I would imagine. So, anyways, that's that's the hot seat and uh, drink of the day. Just like I said opportunity for us to to break the ice a little bit and and kind of ease into the conversation. Um, again, Desiree, really excited to to talk to you and and dig into your background. Um, not not too many folks going to make it as long as as you have in their career. And uh, that's a that's a big accomplishment. Thirty years, I think. Public safety in, in California, a lot of the retirements were based on a thirty year career, so that was always kind of the, the gold standard. Everyone wanted to make it thirty years, um, but to be in aviation specifically for thirty years is, is outstanding. Um, before we dig into kind of your aviation background and, and how you got there, can you talk about where you grew up and and where you went to school and whatnot? I grew up in. Uh the San Fernando Valley, the Valley as they called it. So, um, yeah, uh, it was an interesting time. You know, I was, I grew up in a small town called studio city and there's a lot of movie studios, um, a lot of celebrities. So I, I kind of always was around that. There was always a movie or a TV show or something being filmed right down the street from where we lived. As a kid, my parents got my brother and I into doing extra work. When we were young, we were in a lot of a lot of movies and TV shows, which was kind of cool to be exposed to that early on. And I went to uh, Walter Reed Junior High School and graduated from North Hollywood High School. I uh, didn't go on to college because right out of high school, that's when I knew what I wanted to do. And we'll get into that. But yeah, I started flying pretty much at age 19. You, you bring up North, North Hollywood High School. And I remember in my youth, the North Hollywood shootout had taken place and that was a, a big deal were you in the area when that when that took place yeah i was living in studio city i remember watching it on the news and that was an area i used to drive through all the time i believe that was wasn't it in the 90s um and so i i was a helicopter pilot then and a lot of people i knew uh were flying over that at the time um like i said i was at home and so some of the news helicopters actually took bullets during that shootout but yeah that was a uh, probably the my first experience with like a major shooting anywhere near where I lived so it was yeah, pretty that was scary that shooting kind of reshaped how law enforcement responded to a lot of types of incidents you know and and the types of weapons that we chose because of that 
had a, a big impact, yeah. you know, not just in Southern California, but, but nationwide. So really interesting that you were there in that kind of geographic area, you know, during that time. That's, that's wild. Yeah. Right where that was, we, we'd go shopping there as kids. There was a Sears department store and the whole family, that was our thing. We'd go there. It seemed like we were there every week. That was uh, very close to where we lived. Wow. That's, that's wild. When you think back to your youth, uh, living in Southern California, especially in that part of Southern California, there's a lot of aircraft everywhere. Uh, LA, LA Basin is just a, a busy kind of congested place. Did did any of that have any influence on your desire to, to be become a pilot or, or get into aviation? I think that had a lot to do with it. You know, there's there's two things. There was, I liked birds. <laughs> when I was a little kid, if a bird flew over, I was like, oh, bird, you know, and I was checking it out. And um, I had like a actual blue jay or bluebird that would land in my hand and eat peanuts out of my hand when I was a little <laughs> kid. That's how That's friendly cool. the birds were where I grew up. I was very intrigued with flight. And then where I lived was right there in the Coinga Pass. So that was the major, you know, artery to go from the valley into LA. That was the the flight path for all the low level helicopters, police, fire, EMS, charter, uh, law enforcement, um, you name it. So helicopters were constantly flying over our house and most people would hate that. <laughs> and I actually loved it. That's kind of, I think, part, partly what influenced me as well as I, I believe it's in the blood. My dad was a pilot, although he flew fixed wing and he never took me up as a kid. I never actually experienced flight with my dad because he sold his airplane when my brother and I were toddlers. So I don't really remember much about it, but um, I believe his passion to fly carried on into me somehow. Because he was very supportive when I said, hey, I want to become a helicopter pilot. And then my mom yeah. was scared. <laughs> <laughs> How old were you? Do you remember when you when you made that statement and you first thought, I want to be a pilot? I think it was just when I was 19. But there's photos of me as a little kid next to helicopters. So maybe as a little kid, I, I knew. But I just don't remember saying that when I was a kid. But definitely when I was 19, I'm like, this is what I want to do. And, uh, you know, it was before we had you know, the internet searches and I had to actually pull out a yellow pages and find a flight school in the phone <laughs> <Yeah>. book <laughs> and make phone calls. That's how long ago it was. <laughs> Even though you didn't fly with your dad, do you remember going to airports and, and kind of you know, perusing the airport with him? I remember once going to Whiteman Airport where he kept his airplane, but I was literally like probably a few years old. So I don't remember very much. I just remember being there with them, with my family. And that was about it, but never really spent any time at the airport. Cause like I said, he met, he, he sold the plane pretty early on. I think my mom kind of pushed him into doing that. She's like, you got kids now it's dangerous. General aviation is, I mean, it can be, you know, I think a lot of people do tend to, to, to leave general aviation once they have kids, you know, and, and come back at, at some point later on, unless you're you know lucky enough to be a professional pilot, then it's a little different. Looking back, you know, in your youth, what was the one the one job or the one thing you you told yourself that was your dream job before you decided you want to be a pilot? Was there was there something different? Thank you to our sponsor, Robinson Helicopter Company, the choice for unrivaled safety and reliability so you can accomplish any mission with confidence. For more than half a century, Robinson has been at the forefront of the helicopter industry. From the R-22 to the R-66 turbine, Robinson makes helicopters accessible so more people can accomplish more missions. Climb higher. For additional information, visit www.robinsonheli.com. Well, of course, it was fire. Growing up in Southern California, we're pretty much the news televises vegetation fires year round. And we have fires almost pretty much year round. That was always on television and my parents were always watching the news. So as a kid, I had to sit there and watch the news. And um, not that I was a fan of watching the news, but I was definitely intrigued watching the firefighting helicopters drop water and put the fire out. And I just, I knew then that that was what I wanted to do. I just didn't think it was something that I could do. I didn't know any pilots. I'd never seen pilots in person or real life. I didn't think that that was something just a regular person could do. So I didn't really know how to get into it. Yeah. Two things there. One, going back to your comment about TV, it's funny. You know, another thing about being a kid in, in the 80s and 90s, you watch whatever was on TV is what you could watch. There wasn't many options. There was like, tw you know, 12 channels or something that you could watch. 
And if your mom wanted to watch the news, you're watching the news. And it's not like there was a, a channel dedicated to cartoons and like kids stuff. So typically it was like whatever your mom's watching, it's the news or double jeopardy or, you know, whatever the thing is that she's watching. And like you said, in California, once a, a fire starts, all the networks are going to co- coverage of the fire. So it doesn't matter what channel you go to, you're going to watch coverage of the fire. And it's super impactful living in, in California, in Southern California, the fire season, because, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a threat to everybody with the, the amount of urban interface that exists in Southern California. It's, it's, it's pretty crazy. But yeah, that's, that's interesting that, uh, you know, you can kind of think back and, and maybe trace the lineage of your desire to, to become a pilot. And Richard, for you, when you think back to, to your youth, and I, I remember asking you this before when you were on the podcast, but what was, what was the thing that kind of drew you to aviation? I've got no real history of aviation. I found out recently, actually, that one of my um, grandfather's brothers was a, a, you know, flew in the war as a navigator and a, you know, I've got some photographs of that. So there was, and my grandfather was in the RAF, the Royal Air Force, as during the war again as a, a ground crew because he wasn't able to fly. But I only really found that out as an adult, you know, later d- discussing it with my 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 dad. But I, I always I was always fascinated by aeroplanes, fast jets, and I, I had an aspiration to be a fighter pilot. That's what I really wanted to do: fly tornadoes, which is the met the 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 main aircraft that was flying in the eighties uh, in in the UK a two seater, and you know I, I went a short way through the RAF careers path before I think I I, I realised that I probably wasn't in the top not point not 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 one percent that was going to make it, so I changed my um my I, I readjusted my aspirations and uh, and started to look elsewhere, just like you. I, I I didn't go to college. So I at, at nineteen I made the decision to join the police, and it was only in with once once I got into policing, and I probably had maybe done about thirteen or fourteen years of patrol that I I came across the opportunity to be in involved in air support. So I've, I'm not a pilot. I'm a tactical flight officer, and uh, it I suppose it's quite nice that I've ended up you know making a career out of flying and been involved and around aviation and something that I, I've loved so much and still do. But um, yeah, it was never really something that as a young child, I, I thought I would ever end up doing. Yeah. Well, I think like you said, there's the idea that you have to be, you know, the, the top 1% to, to become a pilot professionally, at least is, is kind of what I thought as, as a child growing up and you know, it wasn't until later on, obviously, in law enforcement that I realized that there was a there's many avenues to get to that that path or that position. And military wasn't the one I took, and there's you know wasn't the one that Desiree took, and and not the one you took. So there's there's tons of different avenues to get there. Um, I remember working for the Forest Service as a firefighter, you know, working in divisions of fires, and you'd see all the aircraft coming in to to drop, and that was I think the first time I was like, holy cow, these helicopters are absolutely amazing, you know it was inspiring for me to be on the ground and see that. And, uh, so it was cool to go full circle and then, you know, get to actually fly. So and now that you're you know, on this side of, of the career, Desiree, what looking back on the path that you took, would you have done one thing different or anything different in the beginning of your career to get to where you got, or were you pretty satisfied with, with the way that all worked out? I don't think I would have changed anything because I, I look back and I, I think, you know, I looked into joining the military. In fact, I, I didn't think you could become a pilot unless you were in the military. I didn't know there you can go the civilian route and you can pay for it, which when you're 19 years old and you're paying for it out of your own pocket, you know, I worked two jobs to pay for my flight lessons and I took lessons as the paychecks would come in. Um, so it was spread out over a couple of years to get my ratings because um, I couldn't get a loan at that age. But I, I looked into joining the military and back then women were not allowed to fly into combat. So I opted not to go the military route because I didn't think I'd get the experience of the flight hours after giving them a commitment. So that was why I chose the civilian route. Later, I looked at joining the military and they said I was too old. <laughs> so things happened for a reason. Um, and then I thought, well, had I, what if I had tried to get into the fire service? You know, um, like there's 
only one department I know of that takes firefighters and allows them to become pilots on the job. In fact, they will not hire outside pilots. They It's LAFD, Los Angeles City Fire. They hire their firefighters and promote them and they pay for their own training. Uh, the pilot does. But um, that was something I thought, well, I wish I had done that because when I was in my 30s, I actually looked at becoming a firefighter. But then the culture, it just wasn't very accepting of women. And I just don't think I would have made it as far as I did had I gone that route. Although it was a lot longer to get where I am and to get the the so-called dream job to get hired with an agency took a lot longer. I definitely, I think, had more experience and got more experience going the civilian route had I tried to get into the fire service. And there, there may have been setbacks and things may not have turned out the way they did now. Yeah, everything happens for a reason. Yeah, absolutely. When you look at the way law enforcement and fire selects their pilots, it's so different. You know, like you said, there's yeah. that's the only agency I know of as well that that hires from the fire line directly to aviation. A lot of the a lot of the applications, the requirements that, that you look at for for job announcements for for fire pilots, the, the requirements are are crazy. You know, you've got to have a, a lot of time and a lot of unique experience to to get into that position. And and that was the thing. Like I I always knew I wanted a, a department job, so every job I did was to build that experience to get that job, you know, to, to get the qualifications and, and meet those requirements on the resume. Now your, your resume is really impressive. You've done just about every kind of, of work you could possibly do in, in, in the helicopter world. When you look at that, of, of all the time that you've spent, what was your favorite, uh, not necessarily job, but what was the favorite segment within the helicopter world that you were part of? And what was, what's been the most challenging of those things? There's a lot of favorites because I think just flying in general is fun. I mean, I've had some really cool experiences flying movie work, you know, flying in some remote areas that I would never have access to except by helicopter, you know, doing seismic and heliski and, um, you know, firefighting. So I, I think honestly, just my favorite thing is what I do now. It's fire and rescue. Um, the work is very rewarding and it's always changing and it's exciting and it never gets old. And there's days where, you know, you just, you can't get complacent because things are constantly changing. And there's days where I, you know, there's pucker factor <laughs> when you out on a call. I'm like, oh my God, this is, this is scary. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, it's risky and we mitigate those risks. And so I think that's kind of the draw to it is the excitement and the, the challenges every day that we face. Yeah. I feel like with the weather considerations you guys have on fires, it's the most, probably the most dynamic type of flying you can do when it comes to, you know, facing these unique challenges between the heat, the the winds, uh, the topography, all the, you know, obscure, uh, the, the smoke that's, you know, it's just, there's a ton of that goes into that. Can you speak to that a little bit as far as some of the challenges that exist in that, in that realm? You know, throughout my career, um, some of the most challenging flying I had was um, at altitude. A lot of it was out of state flying in New Mexico as a contract helicopter pilot, um, fighting fire at 12,000 feet. I mean, what burns up that high, but things do burn. Um, there was a ski resort. I remember on this fire, um, it was, I think it was uh, the Lincoln National Forest. It was where Smokey Bear originally was discovered. And there's a ski resort up there. And so we had to protect the ski resort and the community below. So yeah, that was, I, the winds were insane. I wasn't used to weather in New Mexico. And as far as like the most challenging, I, I would say, honestly, like the rescue work we do right now is the most challenging work we do because when you're, you're fighting fire, you can jettison your load, whether you have a tank of water or a long line with a Bambi bucket, no matter what kind of situation you get into, you can always get rid of that weight and, and get out of the situation. And you usually don't have anyone like if you're a contract pilot, it's just you on board. You don't have a lot of lives that are being put at risk when you're doing that job where with the rescue work, I feel this huge responsibility. You know, I have uh, three other guys on the helicopter with me, including anyone below us, including the patient. So when we're at altitude in horrible winds and extreme, you know, um, weather conditions, it's, it's definitely more challenging knowing that if something goes wrong, I can't just jettison this load. I've got some guy out on the hoist, some guy on the hook. And, and, you know, you have to know when to say no. And uh, when you can actually do the job because you don't want to hurt anyone. And, um, you know, I just have to be thankful that every day to this day, everything's gone smooth. And um, I work with good guys and we fly good equipment. And I've just been very lucky. 
Yeah, you brought up something that we talked about not long ago on a safety panel. When it comes to the selection process, I, I really think one of the characteristics that you need to look for some in, in somebody is their ability to say no. Uh, because, you know, we're, we're put in positions a lot of times where it's hard to say no because your, your coworker, your friend is, you know, in the, in the law enforcement world might be, you know, fighting for the life on the ground and you're hearing them on the radio and you're wanting to respond from the hangar if you're, if, you know, if, and, and given if you've got bad weather, you've got to be able to look at the weather and all the circumstances surrounding what's happening and, and make the decision like, no, it's, I can't go. Or like in the position you're talking about, knowing that there's someone that's, that's on the ground needs to be rescued. Uh, you, you've got to be able to say no because of the totality of the circumstances. So I think selecting for that is really important. It's um, not just skills and abilities, but you're hiring people based on their decision-making. Um, and yeah, it's, you know, there's four of us up there. So we save one and kill four. Um, you know, I don't want to become an incident going to an incident. It's, it's definitely, you know, there's a, a lot of pride and ego for all pilots, male and female. And um, it's definitely hard when you have to say no. I've, I've only had to do it, you know, a handful of times or very few times where, you know, it's been something where I just, you know, I hate it to say no, but you got you just have to. Richard, for you guys, when you're selecting personnel with, with your agency for air support, was, uh, was that any, any of the consideration that went into play when it comes to decision making? We flew in a slightly different way in that we had we had a you know a pilot that typically police pilots in the UK the same the same as Hems pilots uh, they come with a commercial pilot's license they come with you know maybe fifteen hundred hours of flight time minimum you know several hundred hours at night and we fly single pilot uh, some of the Hems aircraft are twin pilot but generally flying single pilot and but we fly as a crew of three so you've got two. TFOs on board, one pilot, and ultimately the pilot has the final say on whether we go. So we would have a, a basic, uh, w- you know, principle of that we'd talk to the pilot as a crew: is it safe to go? Is it legal to go? Because we had quite low weather minima, you know, in terms of visibility and cloud height. We don't really, you know, in in the UK, we don't have the altitudes that you've flown in, you know. <laughs> London, our base was 300 feet elevation, so we're not flying at 10,000, 12,000 feet. Um, but we would, we would, when we were selecting, certainly pilots, we were wanting really confident pilots that were quite happy to to make that decision and explain it and and justify it. Um, we 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 always made it a crew choice, so I never ever in all, it, it was aware of a situation where the crew did not support the pilot in that decision. And in fact, they didn't make the decision as a crew, even though ultimately the captain of the aircraft is the one that will say yes or no. Um, But certainly when we're selecting TFOs, we're selecting people that can be leaders, people that are not afraid to, you know, you're you're talking about constable rank. So it's patrol officers, the sort of the entry rank, and they might be talking to someone who is, uh, you know, an inspector, Chief Inspector, Superintendents, were kind of captain and above in term, police terms, in, and you have to be prepared to um, make those really difficult choices as, uh, under sometimes quite great pressure because nobody wants to say no. I think you said exactly that. You, you don't want to say no, but why? Why be the create another problem when you're trying to go and you know fix a problem? So yeah, that uh, we we definitely bore that in mind but ultimately it has to be the the captain of the aircraft's decision safe or not yeah i agree with that touching on what you said you know um for us it's like four to go one to say no and i i always tell the guys on the helicopter i don't care what your rank is when we're out there don't ever feel like you can't tell me you're not comfortable we have seasonal firefighters who are the lowest rank in our department that are on the aircraft as a second rescuer. Um, and I always tell them, hey, you know, if, if something you're not comfortable with something or you feel unsafe, just just tell me and we're going to abort the mission. Um, I'm not ever going to push anyone to do anything that they don't feel safe, but they generally trust my decision making. And I'm always the first person to say no, <laughs> usually not them. Looking over your resume again, I noticed that you did spend time with uh, the Corona Police Department, which was interesting. Um, when you look back at your time in, in law enforcement, fine law enforcement, was it just over a year that you flew there? 
Thank you to our sponsor, Shotover. Shotover Systems is the leading developer and manufacturer of high-performance gyro-stabilized cameras with advanced real-time AR mapping and mission management, all backed by unparalleled custom training and support. Now offering the M2 multi-sensor system, Soul 6 axis EOIR platform with 4K Ultra HD color and infrared technology. Ideal for law enforcement and defense. Offered with real-time AR overlays to quickly identify streets, weather, and traffic. Automated license plate recognition, 24 megapixel digital photographs, and automated steering and tracking. Yeah, I think it was for like a year or two that I was with um, the company, Aeros Helicopters, that had the contract. I originally was hired with them to do um, heavy lift construction in the A-Star and the Sikorsky S-58. And they had the contract with Corona Police Department where they used the Bell 407 and using us civilian pilots to fly that contract. And that was a lot of fun. I had a great time. Um, you know, the, the TFOs treat it myself and the other pilots like we were one of them i never felt like i wasn't welcome to be there those guys appreciated us they felt like family um it was just it was a really good experience and um you know i learned i learned a lot yeah it was it was a good time yeah how would you compare flying a pursuit as compared to you know dropping on a fire another two different things but what, what was more what's more fun would you say well, I'd say dropping water on a fire is more fun, but <laughs> I will say I went from flying news first where I was chasing pursuits at, you know, a thousand or 2000 feet in a gaggle of news helicopters on top of, you know, maybe one or two law enforcement helicopters flying beneath us. And that was always exciting. It was, it was mostly because you're watching the show live, but when I was flying for Corona Police, we had a few pursuits while I was there and they were insane because um, it reminded me of when I flew um, the Baja 1000 down in New Mexico. I mean, we, except I got lower down there because it's New Mexico, or it's Mexico, but we got really low because my, my TFO was like, I need to see the signs. I need to, to read those street signs, just get low. And so we were just, you know, above the power lines chasing this guy and it was a blast. It was it was definitely way more fun than any pursuit flying I'd ever done, and um, yeah, I liked it. Yeah, that's wild. It, the the media world out here is interesting in, in Southern California, and, and maybe it's this way in London, London too, Richard. But you know, you'll be following pursuit, and there's like like you said, Desiree, there's three or four, maybe five news helicopters above you in trail, and you, the air to air frequency is just it's blowing up with with traffic, everyone trying to communicate with each other. Um, actually our, our second guest on the, on the podcast ever was Tim Lynn. He flew for, for channel five. And, uh, we talked about some of the nuances of, of flying with, with the media, but Desiree, what would your advice be to folks that find themselves in a position where maybe they're not used to flying with, with media and now they've got one or two ships in, a, in and around the area that they're working a call. What kind of advice would you have for them? Good communication. And, you know, being that I had news experience prior to getting into fire, I was always very comfortable uh, having welcoming the news helicopters over the fire where, you know, there's a lot of fires I was on where air attacks like, oh, you know, you guys need to stay up at 10,000 feet or stay out of here. And um, I remember working, oh gosh, I think it was the the day fire in 2006 near Castaic. And I was doing um, PSD, which is basically an aerial admission. We were setting back fires with a with those little um, a PSD machine, which is the uh, plastic spear dispensing machine. And it's basically these little like tiny golf balls filled with potassium permanganate and they're injected with like glycol and they, they explode. <laughs> they, they basically turn into fire. And anyway, so we were doing that and um, there was a news helicopter overhead and he was several thousand feet up and, and uh, he knew I was down there cause they, you know, obviously I went from flying news to fire. And so I don't remember how it all went down, but basically I got permission from air attack to allow the news helicopter to come down and get super low into the fire TFR or fire traffic area with us and, and film us. So as long as, you know, you're communicating and that's really the, the, my, my big thing, but I think, you know, in, in most situations, you're not gonna be able to allow the news helicopters in the fire traffic areas. That was just such a, a, a special incident because the fire was so large and I was working in an area where there was no other aircraft. So it was a, a special incident, but yeah, just having good situational awareness, knowing where everyone's at communicating. 
when I would fly news, I think pursuits were the most dangerous and most challenging because you're you're jockeying for like the best shot. You don't want to lose the suspect. You always want to be on the side where you can show the driver. So you're, you know, every all the helicopters are on the left side trying to get the driver. And then the, he makes a right turn or he makes a left turn and he goes underneath you, or, you know, and now next thing you know, the helicopters that were flying in formation are now scattered all over the sky, crisscrossing each other and, you know, having near misses. And, you know, fortunately in all the years that I've been here in Southern California, we've never had an incident. And we have some of the busiest news helicopter, law enforcement, fire helicopters, some of the busiest airspace around. So we're just very fortunate. And I, I was I was told of, but I never went to one of these. There used to be quarterly meetings with they would they would integrate law enforcement and, and media ships and crews together so they could talk about and deconflict a lot of these incidents. Uh, was that something you were a part of as a ENG pilot? Yeah, you know, we at the beginning of fire season, we would always have like some type of public event where the fire department would put it on and they would welcome the news media helicopters. Um, I hadn't been to any where it was with law enforcement, but mostly the fire departments would say, hey, look, this is our fire traffic area and we're on a fire. You know, this is what we expect from you guys as news helicopters and we're happy to have you overhead. Just you just need to be aware and follow the rules of the fire traffic area and stay stay out of everyone's way. That was basically what that was that was for us here in Southern California. Because I guess we work so frequently with the same news crews, you kind of get to know who's flying, and it it for for me it was really nice because you get to a point where you're working an incident, and if you're transiting airspace, you'll actually one of the, the one of the media ships would would volunteer to to talk the tower for you, so they they they'd check us in as a flight of three or four, whatever the flight was, and they'd handle that for you. And that was really cool. So, uh, and then also, you know, you get a, a chance where, or an opportunity where the, you get four suspects in a vehicle and they all go different directions and the, the news crew, the news ship is, is like taking care of one or two of those suspects for you. So you can concentrate on the driver or something similar. That was really cool too. Yeah. There, there was a lot of times, I think I remember um, there was a news pilot that, the suspect fled and he went to a building and he changed clothes and he got on a bus. But this news helicopter pilot, he followed him and stayed on him and they apprehended the guy and he rode that bus all the way from L.A. to Santa Monica and they got him just because of the news helicopter. Um, there's been pursuits where LAPD would back off because it was like a high speed motorcycle and the news helicopters would stay on him. We'd stay far away and we'd just keep the camera on him and follow him where he went and then give them the address. And like you said, you know, we'd call a flight and it, it was mostly, you know, not just to do anyone a favor, but it was you had to because if if one person didn't call a flight, there's no way, you know, 10 aircraft can get through the airspace calling the tower one by one. We would all get delayed. So someone and usually myself would take it upon themselves to just call a flight for everyone. And the air the air traffic controllers here in Southern California are great. They always knew they 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 were used to it, and so they never questioned it when we did it. And they were really, you know, accommodating when it came to that. Yeah, Richard, what what was your guys' experience with flying with the media in in London? Well, we we I mean we never had um, the the media helicopters ever over the top of a pursuit. It just I, I think in in the UK I'm aware of two. Media outlets that use helicopters. You know, one's the BBC, um, which is the British broad, the sort of state broadcaster. They would have a contract with a, a provider, and the other was an independent, you know, company uh, that would fly for the for the others. And m- maybe there might have been the third, possibly Sky, Sky News. But we we would find them on any pre-planned event, so big sporting events at at Wembley Stadium or big public order events in central London, we would have to deconflict with the media helicopters. And we would do that just by agreeing with them some lateral separation or some vertical separation. And they were excellent. I never, ever had any issues. We knew the pilots. We talked to them all the time. We never had the the kind of thing I've seen in the, in the US where they're broadcasting live the pursuit with the police helicopter. You know, we just... Whenever we were on pursuits, we were absolutely the only helicopter there. So we never, ever encountered those problems. The closest I think I got to that was flying the Tour de France when that came through London. And the Tour de France flies with or travels with three or four helicopters. And and I think the Red Bull Air Race is a Red Bull uh, events are similar where they'll have 
two or three aircraft that are responsible for the package. And I can remember flying from London down to Kent, which is to the sort of south um, east uh, of London, in, in with three or four helicopters, you know, orbiting at different heights. And it, it must have felt to us, I suppose, what it feels like on a, a, a news media pursuit where, you know, you're you're in, on opposite sides of the orbit, you're at different heights, you're trying not to drop too low or trying not to go too high because you've agreed, you know, 500 foot separation or or, or, an, or a lateral separation. So yeah, we, we just, it, it's just not a thing here. You know, I think most of the news media now are using drones, if I'm honest. So you see very, very little helicopter, um, helicopter media or helicopter news gathering uh, and a bit of filming perhaps for the, for the movies and stuff you might get, but really not not a massive issue for us at all yeah yeah the public safety realm is is changing a lot at least in law enforcement with the integration of of drones and i don't really know how how the the eng world's changing as a result of of drone integration are you familiar with what's happening over there desiree i'm really not i've been out of news since i think it was like 2010 so it's been a while since i've flown for the news but um a lot of the the helicopters were combining so you wouldn't, like when I was flying, every news station in LA and every radio station had either a helicopter or an airplane. So if we were over a pursuit, there was 15 of us on, and then you had the law enforcement below us. So there could be, you know, 18 helicopters with a couple of airplanes up there. It was insane. And I think that's just, that's just LA because, you know, as Richard, you were saying, like, you guys didn't have that. I don't think anyone else has that. I think only like, LA County, LA City has that because even when I flew for Corona Police Department, I'd go on pursuits and there was no news helicopters. It was just strictly Los Angeles. And if it extended into Orange County, great, but it was mostly LA. When we'd get the pursuits that, that came eastbound out of LA County, that was the only time we'd get new news coverage was if it was something coming out that they'd already been on. Because otherwise, I think most of the pursuits start. And by the time the the news ships, if they're not on the, if they're not already airborne, fire up and get out there, it's done. So they're not going to waste their time. But if it's in LA County going eastbound, they'll follow it. Then that's where we, you know, cut a lot of that stuff. You know, maybe I'm not just to bring this up, but I noticed different tactics with different law enforcement agencies too. You know, I grew up in LA. So LAPD, those are my, those are my guys. That was my agency where I lived. And, but their policies were different on pursuits. They just monitor, they follow. They weren't as, as aggressive. And when they were, it didn't usually have a good outcome. But when we go to pursuits, um, so there's the pursuits lasted longer. So my point was you, you could, we get the call and the pursuits like lasting an hour or two, we would run out of fuel. We'd have to have the other, make arrangements with the other news helicopter to cover us while we'd go down early for fuel. And we come back up and we cover for them while they go get fuel, you know, and usually it ends in a barricaded situation, but LA County sheriffs, the sheriffs were different. We go to pursuit and they would not last long. They they would just, they didn't care where they were. They'd, they'd pit those guys and they'd end that thing. And it would end without incident. There was never anything bad. They were really good at what they did and their policy was different. They didn't monitor. They didn't follow. They're like, we need to put an end to this. And I, and I, I side it more with that because I always felt like the longer these things went, the more the person's speeding, the more innocent people get killed. And, and it got to a point in my news career where I, I resented pursuits. I hated them because I saw so many innocent people get killed and injured on pursuits because the police were following them and causing them to speed instead of backing off. That was, that was definitely tough to, to watch that. When I think back to the majority of the pursuits that I, that I worked, uh, I think a majority of them ended quickly, not because we successfully pitted them, but they pit themselves, you know, they don't, they're, so inexperienced driving, usually uh, they crash into a tree, they crash into something, and it kind of lends to what you're saying. Um, luckily for me, most of the uh, pursuits that I was a part of, I don't remember very many where uh, uninvolved motorists were, were injured uh, as a result of the pursuit. But that's always traumatic and, and tragic when, when something like that happens. Um, su- super sad. Uh, I mean, ch- changing gears a little bit from something that's sad to something that's funny. You know, working in, in public safety, whether it's fire, EMS, law enforcement, uh, you're on the front lines of, of kind of what, what humanity provides is like the funniest things you could, you could possibly ever see. And then add in the news coverage that you were a part of. You've, you've seen it all, literally. 
from all different angles. Uh, what's, what's the funniest thing that you can recall seeing, whether it's in fire or law enforcement or ENG as a, as a pilot? Thank you to our sponsor, Metro Aviation. Metro Aviation, the world's largest family-owned air medical operator, offers comprehensive aircraft services with 140-plus aircraft in over 25 states. The Completions Center installs medical and law enforcement kits and avionics, serving diverse aviation needs, including offshore, utility, VIP, and corporate sectors. Wow. You know, as far as news, I probably can't talk about what I've seen <laughs> because <laughs> you see a lot of things by accident with the camera. You're just out there filming. The cameramen like to look around. They're always looking for something. And we've come across things that, that we shouldn't have seen. So <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there's a lot of, let's just say there's a lot of places in LA that have um, outdoor areas where you can be with your clothes off. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, as far as like my, the funniest thing I would say recently when I was working for Kern County fire, it was actually, you know, it was a few years ago. It was my first, um, night hoist rescue. So I'm on goggles at night doing my first live rescue with them. And I can't give too many details. Um, I'm sure I'm going to break some sort of patient confidentiality or something, but, the guy was okay. He survived, but he was extremely intoxicated and he was driving his truck and he drove off a cliff. And when they brought him up to the helicopter, first off, I could smell the alcohol and I could smell some, some other things that happened while he was injured. Um, they didn't smell very good. <laughs> so let's just say we had to do a lot of cleanup after. Um, but when they, when we offloaded him, we landed and we, we, handed him off to an ambulance i remember thinking why did you guys cut all his clothes off i mean they were like oh no he he was naked when we got to him oh. he, so he was driving naked drunk it was so yeah that was that was kind of one of those things yeah it was interesting yeah we tend to see that more often than, than we should have to richard i'm sure you guys got your fair share of that as well yeah i mean so i it's i was smiling when you said you've seen things that you probably can't talk about and I, I would agree with that when you're searching especially at night um you do tend to come across things that you probably wouldn't want to talk about on a podcast but um I, I guess the funniest things for me are always the things that suspects will do when they think that you can't see them so you know i've seen suspects lying flat on a roof i can't see you so therefore you can't see me and they, we're just watching them clear as day on infrared, which is always funny because when they eventually have a police dog or a police officer a approach them, they, they they look completely shocked that we knew where they were. The the other thing was um, we have a big sort of refuse, big, big bins. Each house has a, a couple of bins and they, they call them wheelie bins. I don't know what they call them in the States, but they're big enough for a person to get into. And I've more than once seen suspects climb into a wheelie bin and think that they're safe but then of course we watch the wheelie bin getting warmer and warmer and warmer as they're inside and again there's the, the look of surprise on a um suspect's face when uh, when they uh, are found and uh, again more than once we've i've seen videos of uh, from my crews of uh, wheelie bins been wheeled from their location with the suspect still inside and uh, deposited at the back of a police van and the suspect they lift the lid and the suspect has no idea that they've been <laughs> found so yeah you, know, you do see uh, the, uh, the 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 interesting and sometimes entertaining side of life as a as a police officer anyway and specifically as a as an airborne police officer definitely yeah you think of the technology advancements that we've had in, in the the camera technology over the last 10 years or 15 years for that matter uh, you've you've gone to where you know at first it was this you know on the thermal image it was you know this blob of heat that you'd see whether it's black or white you couldn't really tell what it was but now you when know, you're searching a, a backyard of a house and you can see rats and mice running around the the back of a house and you can tell you know you look you look at the backyards you're, you're searching through and you can tell where the hoarders are because that's where all the the mice and rats are, are running around you know 
So yeah, the technologies, the, the advancements have been absolutely amazing when it comes to the thermal imagery. Again, going back to incidents, uh, I'd imagine being in, in fire and rescue, you've got a ton of memorable incidents that you've worked with really positive outcomes. What's one incident that you worked that, that comes to mind that, that you can think of that had a really positive outcome is kind of memorable? There's been a handful of them that had a, a positive outcome um, where I know we made a difference. Had it not been for our helicopter, the, the person wouldn't have made it. They wouldn't be here to this day. So those are always like the most special, you know, or being able to save someone's home, knowing that you were able to stop the fire and their home didn't burn. Um, I remember, I've got a couple, <laughs> I'm going to tell you one, but I was actually working for Cal Fire and, and the I remember dropping uh, on this fire and it was on the news. So I had my moment where I grew up watching the fire helicopters on the news. And now all of a sudden I'm the fire helicopter on the news. And the funny thing was, you know, the, the people, they don't realize there's a woman up there. There's only, there's only me. There's no other women. And, you know, to this day, there's still no women that fly for any fire departments. There's plenty of women that contract privately in the private sector, the forest service, which is what I did to get my start. But anyway, this lady was being interviewed and she said, oh, that Cal Fire helicopter saved my house. And that just, God, that felt so good knowing that. <laughs> and it was me. <laughs> but uh, um, cool. really, one of the most memorable was a rescue I did when I was working for Cal Fire. It was up in Northern California and the weather was just absolute junk. I mean, it was, it's in the mountains. We're along the coast. It's, you know, we're, I was at Neyland, which is near the Oregon border. It was raining, low clouds, fog. Um, we're in deep mountains, canyons. Um, you're having to fly down in the canyon, flying just above the the tall 150, 200 foot tall redwood trees. They have some of the tallest trees in the world or up there in Northern California. And this hunter was out hunting while it's raining and he's riding his quad. And of course the conditions are, are pretty bad. So he flips it and rolls it down some slippery slope. And um, I don't know exactly what happened to him, but he was, he was basically going to die. And so that was one of those times where I felt the pressure to really attempt to try to get to him, but I wasn't going to put my crew at risk. But the thing that I brought to the table, you know, and it was my first year flying for Cal Fire. Uh, it was my first year doing hoist rescue. And, um, you know, I'd done rappel and long line and all of that before. So I had all that experience. But the one thing that really helped me was flying in the Southern California LA basin. For the majority of my career, we have some of the worst weather and we're conditioned to fly in it every day. We flew rain or shine. In fact, when I flew for the news, that was like we were storm chasers. <laughs> we would chase the horrible weather and be up in it all the time. And that really taught me how to navigate through through bad weather. And so we were able to get to this guy. We were able to get him out. It was super um, challenging. We got him to the hospital. And the thing that, that really was memorable to me was I think it was the next day or a couple of days later, the, the daughter of the, the guy she came to visit us at the station and she basically said, you know, had it not been for you guys, he would have died. So she's like, I thank you guys for what you did. And and so that's cool because we don't always hear. And we don't we don't always hear if the patient made it. We don't always hear from the family. So it's it's rare when that does happen. And that's kind of a nice thing. Yeah, that's that's really cool. They don't get that on law enforcement a ton. So it's really neat to hear the impact that you guys make on the on the search and rescue side. We talked about the, some of the weather. And I know people listening are like, you're in California. How could the weather be bad? It's always sunny in California. <laughs> what people don't realize is is LA, a lot of the coastal areas that that uh, are on the California coastline have a lot of marine layer that comes in every every night, just about. And uh, the, the, the cloud deck is super low. So LA Basin, just about, I wouldn't say every night, but I would say uh, maybe three quarters of the year you're dealing with the marine layer that, that comes in and, and that it's, it's, you can count on it coming in in the evening and being there through mid morning, midday. So yeah, you're, you're right. It, as far as dealing with the low visibility and, and low clouds. Yeah. I've, I've had times where we would launch and we would go out and we'd fly under it. And by the time the sun came up, as we'd be doing morning news, the the weather would close in even more and you couldn't get back to the airport. And I, I have a couple of memories of landing on a mountaintop in the sun above the marine layer and it was beautiful. And a couple of the helicopters, we landed there and we just hung out. So <laughs> we just waited until it burned off. So yeah, that's what we did. So we weren't afraid to land anywhere when the weather was bad. And I think that's where what we're encouraging now, right? Is 
and, and I guess we've probably been encouraging it forever, but really in emphasizing landing, you know, if, if the weather's bad, don't push, you know, put it down somewhere that you know is, is safe and, and wait it out. Cause it's going to get better at some point, you know? I think there's a lot of pressure. I think people feel like they're either going to get in trouble for landing somewhere they shouldn't have, or it's going to reflect poorly on them for landing, you know, in a city street in a parking lot. Um, there's, t- I know plenty of news and traffic watch pilots that have done it when the weather's bad, they've put the helicopter down and they were never criticized. Um, but I think a lot of people are afraid. It's kind of like going back to that whole, you're f- the first one, you're afraid to be the first one to say no on an incident. So I think a lot of, a lot of pilots are just, uh, they push because they're afraid they're going to get in trouble by their employer. Um, I've known incidents or crashes where talking to the pilot after they felt like they needed to return to base rather than put the aircraft down immediately. They're like, well, you know, I don't want to inconvenience the the mechanics. I need to bring it all the way back to the airport or whatever the reason is. And it didn't usually have a good outcome. Yeah. And the, the time you've spent in, in the industry, have you seen an attitude towards that shift at all with all the, the PR and, and media campaigns that have kind of been blasted out in, in that regard? I I haven't really seen so much of a shift. I think that's just a personal thing. I think, you know, every pilot has their their comfort level and their um, decision making that goes along with it. And, you know, we still see a lot of incidents through our careers. We have friends that get killed. And, you know, you look back and you you dissect the the incident and you try to figure out what went wrong. Okay, so it was a mechanical failure, but why did it end this way? Like they they were trained to handle this emergency procedure. So what did they do differently that caused it to be fatal? And so I, I, I sadly, throughout my 33 years of flying, I've had a lot of friends get killed. I've had to like try to figure out what did they do wrong so I could try to better myself and people I know and make better decisions. And hopefully it never happens again, but it, it you know, it's not going to never happen again. We're human and we make mistakes. A lot of the institutional memory that surrounds each agency and, and each kind of generation of pilot you know, the, the lessons that are, that are learned during, during those different time spans have traditionally been lost with the retirement of, of each kind of generation. And I think that's part of our hope with the podcast is, is to, you know, further these stories and, and make it to where it doesn't end with that generation or with that person leaving an agency that other people can learn from the lessons that have been uh, taught by, in a lot of cases, blood, you know, just to prevent one accident, you know, from, from happening again to try and break that, that, uh, that accident chain. So, um, that's, that's our goal in, in doing some of this and having these conversations. Uh, when you, again, going back to the, the span of your career, uh, what's one thing that you've seen that has changed in a positive way when it comes to safety over the course of, of your career? When I first started flying, a lot of the companies I worked for, they didn't have, um, like SMS, there was no safety management. Um, there was no flight risk analysis tool. So it was kind of like just CD or pants. There were no like company standards or, or like a policy, like we're not going to fly if it's, you know, this, the ceiling's this low or, you know, I, I didn't, a lot of the companies I worked for didn't have that. I'm seeing more of that now. So I am seeing companies implement um, standards and minimums that the pilots have to abide by whether the pilot says, oh, I could, you know, I could get there. I could fly at 300 feet. Well, our policy is 500 feet. So it's good to see that. I have seen that change, but there are still a lot of the cultures out there where a lot of pilots feel pressured to, to go whether they should or not. And so that's just one of those things we're not sure how to make that change. Yeah. Yeah. Before I uh, retired, I was the, the safety officer and at our, at our unit. And we were doing a survey for agencies to see what their weather minimums were. And I was shocked still it, to get a response from some agencies that said, we don't have one. It's, it's, you know, pilot preference basically. And to me, it, you know, now I'm like, man, I feel like by having a, a weather minimum in place, you, you don't, you, you take the decision out of the pilot's hands and you, in a, in a good way, you know, uh, you shouldn't be flying probably below 500 AGL anyways, if, if you're doing that to avoid clouds, you know, and, of course, there's always the what ifs and, and the outlying circumstances, but I just think it's, you know, for safety's sake, I think it makes a lot of sense to have weather minimums in place and it's specific to your agency and, and what you're doing. So, yeah, I'd like that a lot. Richard, switching to you for the UK, is that something that you guys dealt with and, and saw with, with what you're doing? 
Yeah, so I mean, the weather minima was defined in the regulations that we operate under. So um, it, we had very, you know, the CAA, the regulator would say, you know, for police operations, you are allowed easements against the air navigation order in terms of, um, which is, you know, the kind of laws of the sky in terms of how how close to an object you can get, how low you can be to the ground, how far clear of cloud you need to be, what your day and night uh, visibility uh, levels were. So it was exceptionally complicated. I can remember when I went through training as a TFO, we spent a load of time learning the different weather minima, you know, because it was, if it's daytime and you're in a congested area, it's this height and it's this far from cloud. And But we never really had a problem. It was really, you know, really clear. You never busted those minima. I think coming back to the point on safety, if we, we've spent a lot of time and effort, I think, in law enforcement trying to bring up standards of safety, have safety management systems that are functioning well, develop that kind of safety culture that's just. So, you know, we want people to be honest. It it, it talks to your um, point about not wanting to, you know, to inconvenience the mechanics or, you know, not wanting to be the first pilot that landed when they couldn't get back to base. We, we've I think we've spent a lot of time and effort trying to create that culture where we'd rather you did land and let's look at, at in honesty and openness about how you got into that position. Was it, was it miss, was it unfortunate? Something changed that you couldn't have foreseen. Did you actually take a risk that you perhaps shouldn't have taken? What did you learn from it? And then we pass that on to the, to the, you know, through the unit safety officers to make sure that it doesn't happen again. So you know, we learn from mistakes rather than making the same mistakes again and again and again. And and I think that's really, really important to keep the number of accidents as low as we possibly can get. It's a dangerous business, but we can make it safer. And I think the point you made, Desiree, about, um, you know, you losing friends through your long aviation career. And I mean, I, I'm, I, you know, I can say how shocked I was in that we, we've had, you know, touch with thankfully very few fatal accidents involving police helicopters in the UK or, or air ambulance uh, helicopters. But when they happen, they they send a shockwave through the industry. And I think you, you all want to look at that and say, well, what went wrong? And perhaps people that aren't in aviation don't understand. I've had this conversation with non-aviators about a pilot's fascination with others, the accidents that other people have. They kind of think, well, why would you want to read that accident report? Why would you want to remind yourself every day of how dangerous this business is? But actually, in my experience, pilots and aviators want to know every last detail of what caused an accident because they want to make sure it doesn't happen to them. And what can they learn from it? And that's how you stay safe. And that's how you have a long and uh, distinguished aviation career. And I think they're, they're really valid and valuable lessons for us all is that we never become complacent. Yeah, that's exactly it. And every fatal crash where it's been someone that I was close to and not just a colleague, but someone that I was actually, you know, friends with. I actually just this year, you know, not to, to sound uh, depressing, but I finally started removing people from my phone I that were killed flying. Um, I had a lot in there and I was like, I, I just have to, I got to let this go. And it felt terrible doing it. But, you know, I, I when I fly, I think about all those friends, all those people. And I try to just constantly remind myself of what happened to them and how can I prevent this from happening to me? I and mean, that's really what it is. It's just to learn. Yeah, it's interesting you bring the phone up. Uh, that's I've had the same thing. I've got a ton of contacts on my phone that it's hard to clear out. You know, it, Yeah, you, you feel bad deleting them. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it's weird. Yeah, I didn't really think about it a ton until you brought that up. I'm like, yeah, I still have... I still have a ton of those contacts on my phone as well. You know, being in law enforcement and then it, and it mixed in aviation and in, in, in there as well, you feel like you're kind of just surrounded by by bad news. Makes you want to to pull pull back sometimes and and put your head in the sand. But you know, to what you're saying, Richard, I think it's important that we pay attention to the details to hopefully prevent that from happening to ourselves and our, our coworkers. You know, so you've you've made it a long way in your career. You know. And and you're 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 still doing your thing. You're still happy, and you saw this kind of infectious attitude towards aviation that I think, you know, most everybody has. But it's really cool to see it still after after 30 years. 
uh, looking back on the time that you've that you've spent in aviation and all the jobs you've had, is there one that you're like, oh, this was probably my, my the favorite era or the favorite time of, of my piloting career? This is the end of part one of our conversation with Desiree Horton. Stand by for a message after a word from our sponsors. Thank you to our sponsor, Robinson Helicopter Company, the choice for unrivaled safety and reliability so you can accomplish any mission with confidence. For more than half a century, Robinson has been at the forefront of the helicopter industry. From the R-22 to the R-66 turbine, Robinson makes helicopters accessible so more people can accomplish more missions. Climb higher. For additional information, visit www.robinsonheli.com. Thank you to our sponsor, Shotover. Shotover Systems is the leading developer and manufacturer of high-performance gyro-stabilized cameras with advanced real-time AR mapping and mission management, all backed by unparalleled custom training and support. Now offering the M2 multi-sensor system, Soul 6 axis EOIR platform with 4K Ultra HD color and infrared technology. Ideal for law enforcement and defense. Offered with real-time AR overlays to quickly identify streets, weather, and traffic. Automated license plate recognition, 24 megapixel digital photographs, and automated steering and tracking. Thank you to our sponsor, Metro Aviation. Metro Aviation, the world's largest family-owned air medical operator, offers comprehensive aircraft services with 140-plus aircraft in over 25 states. The Completions Center installs medical and law enforcement kits and avionics, serving diverse aviation needs, including offshore, utility, VIP, and corporate sectors. Thank you for listening to the message from our sponsors. I'm very grateful for their support. We always talk about it, but we truly would not exist if it weren't for their support for the podcast and the industry as a whole. I just want to take a minute and thank you all as well who listen to the podcast. It's very encouraging for us to hear back from y'all, whether it's over social media, email, or text to give us feedback on the episodes that were impactful to y'all. If you have a guest idea or request for a specific topic to be covered, go to verticalhelicast.com and fill out the guest inquiry form, which can be found under the contact us tab of the website. Time to close up the hangar. Thanks for joining us on the Hangar Z podcast, brought to you by Vertical Helicasts.